Okay, so if you have not done so already, go ahead and uh, respond to the uh, the attendance poll. Let me know that you're here. And uh, and today we'll take a look at object-oriented programming in R. Uh, but before that, I, I want to uh, just cover a couple debugging tips and strategies. Um, a couple of you guys came to uh, office hours, and some of you, uh, and I've been kind of trying to follow along um, just some of the stuff that's been happening on Piazza. And, you know, um, I don't want anybody to, to be discouraged, but, you know, if you come to office hours or, or something like that, uh, one thing I, uh, I don't do is I don't debug your code for you, okay? But I do a lot, but what I encourage you, and, and I think everybody should do this as they're writing code, is, um, you know, if you come to office hours and your code's not working, I'll have you explain the logic of your code, and I'll ask some questions along the way that will maybe point you to, you know, possible errors or gaps that you, you might have missed. Uh, and, and I think that is a lot more helpful in helping you learn how to debug. So I, I'm not going to, generally I try not to look at your code and debug it for you, but um, I'll kind of walk, I'll have you explain to me your logic, which, which is a good exercise for you yourself. And then uh, I'll, I'll ask you questions about it. Okay, but here I'm like, I want to do like an example of stuff you can do to help debug, okay? And so one strategy is just put print statements everywhere, print or cat statements everywhere, um, because a lot of times the reason why your functions don't work is because in your mind you have an if statement and the if statement should take on a certain value, true or false, and yet when the program runs, that if statement, you know, takes on a different value. And, uh, and so what helps is that when you write a function, right before the if statement runs, you print out the value that that's the condition inside the if statement, okay? So, um, so for example, here I'm, I'm writing this terrible function called winner in row one, okay? And it's going to take the state function, and it starts off with maybe uh, the result we'll put in, uh, we'll say it starts off with result equal to no winner. And then it's going to say if state space 1 is equal to x and state space 2 is equal to x and state space 3 is equal to x, then print x wins, and we will change the value in results to x. Okay. And likewise, we do if state 1 is 0 and 2 is 0 and 3 is 0, then we'll print x wins and result is O, and then we'll return the result. Okay, this is this is a terrible way to go about it. Okay, so don't don't look at this as any kind of example that you should use. I'm just I tried to make a terrible example that that's going to run into problems. Okay. All right, and then um, and then over here I've got this function where we're going to start off, um, and here I have this option called debug equals false, this is just the default thing. But we're going to start off with no winner equals true, and I'm going to create a, a blank state. State is repeat missing nine times, and then it's going to say while well, no winner, which is currently true, we're going to uh, we're going to check the result. We're going to say result is the result of winner in R1 state, and if the result is X or the result is O, change no winner to false, okay? And then over here, just so the, the function will run, I start with i equals one, and then we're gonna just change, uh, we're gonna just update state one to x, and then we'll print out the state, and we'll update i, um, i equals i plus one, and then it'll kind of loop through, and it'll, up, it'll just stick in x's, X into state one, state two, state three, and we're hoping it will exit, okay? So this is just a, a rudimentary thing. Okay, do you guys see any problems with this if I try to run it? Okay, well, let's try this, all right? So I'm just gonna just try running F1. Okay, and then right off the bat, here, are you guys able to read this? Let me see if I can make, I think my text is already quite huge. Uh, uh, but I'll make it bigger for you guys, okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so when I run F1, I get right off, it says error in if state one equals this equals this, and I get missing where true false is needed. Okay, so um, there's a few things that we can do to help us debug, okay? So, um, um, so I mean, right away, you know, if you look at this, you can probably figure out what's what's going going wrong, okay? But what I like to recommend is, you know, right before going into a loop or something, so the loop, the no winner, we should see what the value of no winner is, right? So I'm going to just put in the statement print no winner, okay? Now, um, in order to kind of change if this works or not, I'm going to do if debug, okay, which is currently set to false, okay? So if I reprogram this and I write F1, then it does the exact same thing before, but if I say F1 and I say debug equals true, then, um, then it prints out the value of this. Now this, all by itself, true is, is a little bit hard to see. So instead of doing print no winner, I often I'll recommend cat and say uh, no winner equals and then we'll do no winner, and then we'll put in um, a new line function, new line there. Okay, so this will this will change um, as as we're running the uh, the function. Okay, it's gonna um, do this, and we'll get f1, and I say debug equals true, and then as it runs, I can say okay, at least I know no winner is equal to true which means um, this while loop will run, okay? And then uh, we'll create, uh, um, and I'm, I'm going to do basically the same thing over here, okay? So I'm going to say if debug, we're going to say state equals state, okay? So we'll, we'll run this, and then um, Now I'll run this, okay, so I have no winner is true, state equals na, 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 and then so now this is, this is starting to give me an idea why I'm running into this problem, right? Um, because what I can also do here is I can also create just a, another second option. I'll say debug equals false, and um, I'll say if debug, then we'll cat. Um, you know, condition one, and we'll we'll just put in this entire statement there. Okay, and, I, and I've got to put in kind of these new line things so that um, so condition one, which is um, x wins row one, right? Condition x wins row one. That's what this condition is supposed to test. We'll do that, and then um, we have to just do uh, if winner in state one debug equals true. So here, let me just click source here, and then we'll try this again. Okay, we'll do debug equals true. All right. So we have no winner. We can see the result of no winner is true, the state is empty, and we can see condition x1 wins row 1, this is currently na. And it's quite clear that it's going to be na because if state 1 is missing, it can't check to see if it's x or something like that. So um, if we think about it, and, and some of you guys might have gotten frustrated with using the nas, um, but what we can do is we can just check to see if row one has any missing values. If row one has any missing values, then certainly there's no winner in row one, okay? So what, what I have to do now is I'm gonna do just if any is na of basically state um, one, uh, one through three. If any of state one through three is missing, then, um, then we can quit the function, right? The result is going to be no winner. We'll just actually leave it uh, as is, and we'll just click uh, do return result, okay? 
And then when, uh, as soon as a function hits a return statement, it's going to quit. It's not going to bother checking. Okay. So, um, so right now, so this just means, you know, if any value in row one is missing, there's no winner. Okay. So just by adding that statement, that should make our thing go away. And so we'll try that out. Okay. And then we'll try this over here. And then we can try F1. And we'll do debug equals true. Oops. Ah, I'm having trouble typing. OK. OK, and um, all right, so, so it seems to be running <laughs> a lot. And, uh, and maybe something is not working the, uh, the way we want it to work, right? So, so uh, it kept running and running and running. All of these statements are being printed out, right? Winner, so, so what it seems to be doing, winner is true, state is NA, and then it puts an X here, and then um, and it keeps doing that. And uh, what I was hoping is that uh, the state would update to X, the first one being X is 1, and, uh, and X is 2, and X is 3. Okay, and do you guys see what the problem is? Okay, so, so we can see what's going on. All right, so we just keep adding uh, some debug statements. All right, so we're going to say if debug, and what we want to do here is every time you're changing a variable, we're going to say cat i is equal to i, okay, and uh, and then it prints the uh, the statement, okay, and uh, and so I'll go ahead and I'll. Um, I'll run this, and I've got to kind of intercept it quickly because it's going to run, run quickly. OK, so we can see all of this. Every single time I'm running this, i is equal to, st I is equal to 1. And I was hoping I would update to 2. Okay, And the problem is, is that I'm assigning the va value i equals to 1 inside the while loop. So every time it runs through, even though I get i is equal to i plus 1 and it updates to 2 here, when the loop runs back, and starts off with no winner again, i gets reset back to 1. Okay, So I've got to set the i equal to 1 outside of the while loop. Okay, And then we'll try this. All right. So you know, debugging is, it can, it can feel tedious, okay? but it's often because as you're working, you know, some of these things, right, you, if we didn't print any of this stuff out along the way, and we're not sure where our values are, it's hard to figure it out. But you add these statements to let you know what these values are every single time you run them, and then it becomes easier to track down the errors. Okay, and so now I can try um, f1 with debug equals true. Okay. And, uh, and so now we get uh, no winner true state is this. We put an x here, x here, and then I, x is 3. And then now we get uh, condition x wins row 1 is true, x wins, and it stops. And then you know our code keeps going, and, and we get i equals 4, and, and it puts it down a fourth thing. And so maybe that's not what we wanted. Maybe we need to say, like, as soon as um, we get a winner, uh, we need to uh, exit out the function or something like that, right? So no winner is false, is now false, but we're also going to just break out of the function or something, okay? Because we don't want it to continue running. So, um, so this seems to to work a little bit better now that i is three. It quits, uh, quits right there, okay? So uh, all of this stuff. This is with debug equals true, and then if I didn't have debug equals um, turned on to true, um, you know, it doesn't print, uh, it prints out a lot less. Um, you know, I, I have to probably actually set debug equal to debug, debug here, okay? And um, okay, so, so anyway, um, all to say, uh, you can help things out by adding a bunch of these kind of cat and print statements um, to kind of help you figure out where where you're encountering issues. Because a lot of times you think 
the uh, the if statement, the condition has a certain value, but it's actually not that value. And so right before an if statement or right before a while condition, you know, print out the value of that thing. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. I, I think that's actually enough to get you through it. Uh, I think we're going to run out of time to talk about the, the actual debugger. The debugger is uh, um, within a thing, within a script, you can uh, click to the left of the number, and I'll, I guess I'll, I'll talk about it very briefly here, okay? You, you can click, a, like a, create a breakpoint here, and then when you click source, um, it activates, and when you run something, okay, uh, when it hits the breakpoint in the command, it brings up the browser, okay? And you'll notice inside the uh, environment, you have, you can see thing, values that exist in the global environment, and you can also check inside the execution environment, okay? So remember, when a function runs, it creates its own separate sandbox environment where it has variables and values. And so you can look inside function f1 and see the current values that exist in there. And we can see i is 1, the current no winner value is true, and things like that. And then um, you can just click next, and, uh, and it runs again, and, um, and it keeps going through the lines of code. Um, and as you hit continue, um, it'll run through kind of things and we can see i updates to 2 and so on and so forth and as as we run um, you can see how uh, the values inside the functions execution environment um, go on okay so um, so that that's one thing that you can do is you can create breakpoints um, but I, I think the print statements is is useful enough okay all right now we can talk about uh, object-oriented programming. Um, well, I don't know. Are there any other questions regarding uh, debugging and whatnot? Um, I, I see a lot of good discussion. I guess uh, you know the other important thing to note is that um, you know if you look at I think in my notes from Wednesday I talk about avoiding super assignment. Um, it's important that you know you run your function and you save the output of your function, okay? And your function should generally uh, be simple and self-contained, and um, try not to embed functions inside other functions. Like try not to call other functions from inside other functions because you have to keep in mind that if you call a function inside another function then you're creating basically an execution environment inside another execution environment, okay? Or, or you're, call, you're setting up, not creating, but you're, you're setting up execution environments that, that don't really talk. So, um, so I recommend, in my recommendations, I recommend having just the play function be kind of the entire wrapper, and within the play function, you're calling other functions, but those other functions you're calling inside the play function should not reference other functions, okay? so. Inside the play function, you call you call a function, you update the value. You call another function, you update the value. You call another function, you update the value. Don't don't call functions inside other functions. Okay. All right. We're going to talk about object oriented stuff here. Okay. Um, the idea behind object oriented programming is that um, there are classes of objects. Okay. And when you have a class of an object then functions um, will behave differently for certain classes, okay? Uh, and so you, um, um, so there's kind of this idea of an object taking on a class which will define its behavior, and then methods are basically the verbs or the functions or the actions that you do, and the behavior of the methods will be different depending on the class of the object, okay? Um, and what this allows us is that we can have, so a, a benefit of the object-oriented system is that you only have to remember a few function names, right? You only have to remember the function name print. But technically, the, 
function print will behave differently if you give it a factor versus a data frame versus an atomic vector, okay? Because when you print out a factor, it prints the contents of the factor without quotes, and it also prints out that line that says levels, okay? When you print out a data frame, remember, inside R it's stored as a list, but when you say print to data frame, it prints it out like a table, okay? And, and it would be a lot, um, I don't know, a little bit more cumbersome if you had to remember, oh, this thing is a data frame, so the function name that I'm calling is going to be different than this thing over here, which is an atomic vector, and I have to call it different. And, and so uh, inside R, there's actually like 100 different kind of print functions, okay? But you don't have to remember the names of every specific print function. You just say print this thing, and R figures out which version of the print function to run, okay? And so um, within R, there's actually three different types of object-oriented systems, okay? There's S3, and this is probably the most important one, and this is the one that you're going to be responsible for learning, uh, and you'll be tested on S3. There's also S4 and reference class things, and I'm not going to test you on those, but they do exist in R, and, and we'll, we'll cover uh, what they do in lecture as well, um, probably on Monday's lecture. So um, uh, I'm not sure what your programming background is, but if you've come from a different language, R's object-oriented system called generic function object-oriented uh, I guess the generic function system uh, might feel a little bit strange. So if you're coming from, say, Java or C++ or Python, you would define a class, and within the class you define methods, okay? And you'd say, uh, you know, this is, you know, this object is class, uh, I don't know, car, and the car has the method, I don't know, start motor or something like that, okay? Um, that doesn't exist. Okay, you, um, you kind of define classes on the fly in R's S3 system, and the functions have uh, behave in a generic method, and, and we'll talk about all of this in, in, a, in a moment, okay? The others are uh, S4. S4 is very similar to S3, except it's formal, okay? S3 is ad hoc and, uh, and very loose, and uh, you just define func uh classes on the fly. S4 is a lot more formal, okay? And then reference classes is the probably the object-oriented system that um, other, that's most similar to other languages where um, the methods belong to the, uh, the class, okay? And then there's also base types. Um, base types are um, uh, the things that we've been working with so far, atomic vectors and lists and those things. And those are kind of implemented in R using uh, C language type things for speed. Um, and, and pretty much all of the other objects are built on top of base types, okay? Uh, and so we're, uh, we're accustomed to base types already, okay? And you can look up the base type by doing type of, and it will tell you, you know, this is integer type, this is um, a list, this is this and that, okay? Um, but you also have um, things like functions and environments, and then there's also names, calls, and promises. Those are all different base types, um, and so um, so those exist. Okay. The unfortunate thing is that um, you know the the naming got a little bit weird. So if you create a function and you say type of, it will say closure, but then if you want to know, is it a function, you say is.function, okay, which is a little unfortunate. Most of the other things work fine, you know. It'll say base type, you type, say type of, and it's integer, and you say is it is.integer, and it, and it works fine. But, uh, but there's a few things. There's like built-in, uh, but they're also known as primitives, okay. Um, okay, bye. Um, so if... Uh, you have, um, you know, the, the type of, those, those will tell you the, uh, the base types. And over here, if something is an S3 object, it's going to say is.object, okay? And so um, uh, you can ask, is it an S3 or an S4 object? 
and you can see, uh, you know, is it an object, okay? And so uh, if is object returns false, then it's going to be a base type, okay? If is object is false, it's a base type. Okay, so uh, we'll talk S3, and, uh, and this is kind of the, um, the simplest object-oriented system that R has. It is um, very minimalistic, but it works, okay? Um, there's not a simple way to check if something's an S3 object. You have to say is object, and this needs to return true, but is object will return true for uh, S3 and S4 in reference class. So you have to say, uh, and is it not S4, okay? So is it an object but not S4? Then that will be the indicator that it's an S3 object, okay? There's no is S3 function. <laughs> there's no is S3, okay? Mm -hmm. It's is object, and then later on they said, okay, well, maybe we can do is S4, but there's no is S3, okay? It's a little bit silly, but yeah, th that's what we've got. Okay, so for example, a data frame is... Uh, an object, okay, S3 object, and so if we create a data frame, we can say, is it an object? It's true, and then we say, is it S4? Then it'll say false, okay? So the combination of it being an object but not being S4, that will be the indicator that it's an S3 object, okay? Um, when we created the data frame, I have X is 1 through 10, and so when I do DF dollar sign X, remember, it reduces it down to a vector, okay? And so when it reduces down to a vector, we ask, is it an object? It's going to say no, OK? Uh, whereas df dollar sign y, how does y get encoded? It's going to say strings as factors, all right, is the default. So when it turns it into a factor, so if I say, is it an object, df dollar sign y, it's going to say true, OK? And a factor is also an S3 object type, OK? Everything in um, R's base types and stats package Everything, if it's an object, it's going to be an S3, okay? So um, only like later packages start to implement S4. Okay, um, so in S3, we have something called generic functions. And, um, and basically, these are just, uh, you have a function like the function mean or the function print, and it will behave differently depending on the object we give you, okay? And, and you as humans, as people, also have kind of, uh, you, you're accustomed to this idea of behaving differently given a certain thing. So if I, um, if I give you a baseball bat and I give you the command swing, okay? And I say, swing what's in your hands, right? And you, if I've given you a baseball bat, then you're going to swing it like this, right? You're going to swing it like a baseball bat, like a regular, assuming you've seen a baseball bat, right? OK. And, uh, but on the other hand, if I give you a golf club and I say swing, OK, the motion you do for swinging the golf club Okay, will be different, right? Even if you don't, if even if you've never played golf, you know that you're not supposed to swing it like the way a baseball bat is swung. But you, you know, you put your head down and you, you, I don't know, you, you swing it differently, right? Um, and basically, uh, if I give you anything that, uh, if I give you some other thing like, um, uh, and if I give you a, I don't know, like a. I don't know, a rope or a lasso or something, okay, a whip, and I say swing it around or swing it, you know, the motions you do will be different, right? I've given you the same command of swing, but depending on the object you're holding, you know that you're supposed to do something different, right? And then if, if I give you a book and I say swing the book, then you'll be a little bit confused, but you'll, you'll figure out some kind of swinging motion to do, right? And that's basically what R is doing, okay? We have the name, the function mean, but depending on the kind of object we give it, uh, it's going to behave differently. We have the function print, and depending on the type of object we give it, it's going to behave differently. They, overall, they do something similar, right? Um, they're going to print out the contents of the object. They're going to find what it, you think should be the mean, but but the behavior is, is a little bit different, okay? So similar to, um, you know, how, how we do stuff, okay? And so the way it figures out which version 
it needs to do, use is called method dispatch. Okay, so it says, I need to, you've asked me to calculate the mean of this thing, and I need to figure out, do I use the default version of mean? Do I use the version of mean for date objects? Do I use the version of mean for, I don't know, this other, time, you know, some other kind of object? Um, and, uh, and that is done just by using this function called use method. So if you look at, um, if you come to R and you just type in uh, the word mean, okay? Well, actually, if you type in the word mean, you're going to see like dot date and dot default and dot whatever, all of this stuff. If that's a good indicator that it's a generic function, okay? But you can also say mean without the parentheses, and if you hit enter, you're going to say, okay, the def definition of mean is that it's a function, and it's basically, its only line of code here is use method mean, okay? And if you see use method, then that means this is a generic function, right? Same with print, okay? If I say print, you're going to see use method print, okay? Use method just means, use method print means I've created a generic function and we're going to look up versions of the function print, okay? And these, and it also tells you stuff. It tells you it's in the uh, package namespace base and things like that. Okay, so uh, if you see use method, then that means it's a generic function. All right, um, this is a big wall of text, but basically, the way uh, it's going to figure out which version to to run is that um, we have a specific naming convention in uh, in R. Okay, so when you look up, when you start typing in print, okay, then all of this stuff pops up, okay? And it, you've got print.asis, print.by, print.connection, print.data.frame, print.date, print.default, and these are all the different versions of the print function, and the part that comes after the dot, that is the class that it applies to. So print.data.frame is the print method applied to data frame objects, okay? So if you, you can actually look at it and it's going to say, now it's going to try to figure out, um, you know, the data frame. And so remember the dimensions of a data frame are not actually stored as an attribute. You've got row names and column names. And so it says, oh, I got to figure out how many rows I've got. And so it's going to do row names and the length, and then you know it says n and things like that. But this is this is the function that gets run when uh, when we run print print dot data frame, okay? Um, and you can look up you know what well what is print dot default? This is whoops. Okay, this is this is what what happens. You can see well, and then um, print dot factor. This is the version of the this is what runs when you give the print command a factor object, okay? So the use method, the method dispatch will say, oh, you have given me a factor. Therefore, I am going to run print.factor to print this object out, okay? And, and you can see, um, I don't know. It prints out a bunch of stuff, okay? You don't have to worry about the actual code. But basically, um, it's going to be, you know, the generic name of the function, whether that's mean or print or, uh, I don't know, um, summary or, you know, whatever. You've got these generic functions, dot the name of the class, okay? And so um, today, we discourage the use of dot in functions' names. So for example, there is a function called t.test, which conducts a classical t-test, right? You compare, you know, the, the means of two samples, are they equal or not? But the way this is written, okay, is confusing because it might seem it is the function t, which actually exists, right? The function t transposes a matrix, and it might appear that this is actually the function transpose applied to objects of class test, okay? It's not, but the way this is written can give that appearance, okay? And also print.dataframe 
data.frame. Um, this is the print method for data frame objects, data.frame objects, but somebody else could be confused and it, they could think it's the print.data method for frame class objects, right? So, you know, to avoid that ambiguity, we generally discourage the use of dots in, in naming things, but, but whatever, it's, it's fine, okay? So um, there's a function called prior that gives you some, some information, and you can see if a function is an S3 generic, okay? So t.test is a generic function, um, and you can also ask what are the methods associated with t.test, and there's actually two versions of t.test, okay? There's the default t-test, which will work if you give it um, two vectors, and it'll compare the means of those two vectors. And then there's t-test.formula, -t which, which will work if you give it uh, a formula as you know, x related to some other variable. Um, t.dataframe, we can ask, um, are there are there methods associated with t.dataframe? There's not, because it itself is a method specific for, for data frame objects, OK? And we can ask, you know, what are the methods associated with the function t? And it says, OK, there's the default t, which will be used on matrices, and then t.dataframe, which can be applied to um, data frames. So for example, and, and so just kind of an example, here is um, I should have printed out the. Um, so when you uh, ask for x, it's going to create it column wise with one, two, three, four going down the columns, right? With four rows. And then when you call the function t on x, it transposes it, and now you have four columns uh, and only three rows, okay? So t called on x um, can, works on a matrix. Over here, I've created a data frame. And we can call t on the data frame, and again, it will transpose it so that what used to be columns are now rows. Okay, and again, <clears throat> it doesn't seem like it's doing. This doesn't seem impressive, but R knows that because this is a matrix, it's going to behave this way, and because this is a data frame, it actually calls a different function. Okay, so there's there's different functions being being called here. So you can look up t.default and see the actual code that's being run. Okay, it's a it's an internal. Okay, and, but it's just swapping all of the uh, the places. And then t.data.frame. Oops. What it's actually doing is it's converting um, the data frame into a matrix, and then it calls the the t method on the d default thing. Okay, um, which which is not that. Surprising, but uh, but that's what it's doing. Um, it knows to uh, to do these things. Okay, um, and you can always look up the methods that are associated with a function. Just say methods for mean, and it will list off the different types of <coughs> mean methods that exist. And uh, and t test again, we had default and t test for formula and things like that. And then you can also look up all of the methods that exist for a given class. So here, if you have an object of class TS for time series, there's different um, methods that, that exist here. All right, um, so you can actually just create your own classes very sim simply, OK? Um, here you can use the command structure. And then um, and you just create it around something, and then you just specify class. And here uh, we've defined class foo. Okay, you can even just take the object. So here I'm just going to create an object called foo, which is an empty list. And then all I do is just after the fact, I say I'm going to create a class called foo. Okay, and this right here just suddenly defines a new class. Okay, which is just very quick and on the fly. And um, and you can ask, well, what is the class of object foo? And it will say it's of object uh, class type foo. And um, and there's a function for inherits if it inherits um, properties from other classes because classes are often organized in hierarchies. 
Okay, and so um, the class of an object itself can be a vector, meaning, um, for example, you can create uh, linear model objects and you can also create GLM, generalized linear model objects, okay? And when you do that, the resulting object will have this class. It will have class GLM LM, which means uh, when R looks up methods for it, it's going to say, well, this is an object of class GLM. Do we have a method specific for GLM? So if you say, you know, print, print the model, okay, it's going to look for print.glm. And if it finds that, it's going to run that, okay? But if it doesn't find a method specific for GLM, it's going to say, okay, well, let me see if there's any methods that are specific for LM, okay? So for example, um, you might give, tell somebody, um, you know, cheer your friend, okay? And your friend, um, if, if we were doing some kind of hierarchy, right, the command we gave them was cheer. And uh, um, maybe your, your friend has, uh, belongs to different classes, right? So the class, the most specific, maybe it'll be like, um, uh, is a, I don't know, gymnast. And, uh, and then the next class will be a UCLA athlete, and then the third class will be just, um, I don't know, student, right? And so when you say, uh, I, I don't know, are there any specific cheers for gymnasts or whatever, right? Okay. But then, you know, when you get the cheer, you'll say, like, um, when you get this command, you'll, you'll pick the, the thing that's most, uh, that applies most specifically to this thing. And so, you know, um, and if there's not a specific cheer that exists for, um, you know, Bruin gymnasts, then you'll just go to the, uh, the less specific one and, and you'll say uh, UCLA athlete. Okay. And then so you can find the generic method, or not the, the, not the generic, but the method for that. And you'll just be like, go Bruins, right? And that would work for any UCLA event, right? But then if it's like, um, um, if it's like, uh, football player, okay, then you have a specific cheer, right? You have like the eight clap and things like that, that are, you know, specific for these type of things. Cause I don't know, I guess you could do a, an eight clap at a gym, gymnastics event. Do they do that? Yes. Okay, all right, never mind. Then, um, okay. But in some such situations, right? I don't know, chess club at, it might feel weird doing an eight clap at the uh, <laughs> chess tournament, okay? Um, I don't, yeah, whatever, okay, this, but basically, you look up something, and if, if the most specific version exists, use it, and if it doesn't, use something less specific until you just use the default, okay? Um, you might have a constructor function. Uh, it looks like we're gonna run out of time, but we'll go over uh, some of these things, okay? One of the things is that um, S3 has no safety checks, okay? Meaning, um, you can create an object, and then you can just um, modify its class, okay? So for example, here I'm gonna create something called model, okay? And this is a linear model between uh, the relationship between log of miles per gallon and log of displacement in the engine, okay? And when we ask, what is the class of this model? It's gonna say it's a linear model object. And when you say print the model, it doesn't, it prints the specific output that applies to linear model objects, which prints out this formula and the coefficients and things like that, okay? And that makes sense. But later on, I could just say, um, you know what, let's change the class of this object to data frame, okay? And R allows you to do this. This is a terrible thing to do, but, but uh, you can do it, okay? And so now when I say print a model, it's gonna to try to print it out as if it were a data frame and it gets confused, right? It says zero rows in this, in this thing, okay? But the data, it's not that the data has been deleted, it's just when you try to print, print out the model as if it were a data frame, it doesn't know what to do. And so, um, so it gets confused, okay? So basically, don't do stupid things like that, okay? Uh, you can, but, um, but it's not a good idea. All right, uh, looks like we're running out of time. Uh, I'll talk about creating new methods and generics um, 
here, uh, I, I guess on Monday. But uh, but we'll see you guys. Uh, we'll see you then. <laughs>